Right, welcome back to another week of Zambert Lives where we usually talk about the news, columns, interviews that we host on our magazine, Zambert Media. Um, but this week is kind of different. Well, um, this week I had very little time for preparation. Uh, I just returned from Fukushima. And not just any part of Fukushima, uh, it's the coastal area of Fukushima, you know, where the net, uh, nuclear disaster happened. Um, I was in the exclusion zone. I visited regions within the five kilometers and ten kilometers regions. Um, what else? Yeah, I visited the nuclear plant itself. It was huge, man. Um, I was standing like just five hundred meters away, and I don't think I'll ever forget the site, even after it gets it gets com- decommissioned and the things get cleared up. Um, it takes some time to get the article out. Of course, I did some interviews there, and it's true what the one of the Ryokan owners, one of the accommodation owners said. Um, whenever we talk about the nuclear disaster, it usually always comes back to who's to blame and what kind of compensation. But what I've learned and what Fukushima really wants to show us is that there's more to that, you know. Uh, especially for the passionate people who have returned to the coastal areas and there is um, a very interesting potential for future Fukushima so yeah I look forward to writing that I also met um, Seimei San a 97 year old uh, uh, he's a what, what we call a wise, wise old man you know and he chose to return back to his place in Minami Soma which is which is within the, uh, I believe it's the 10 kilometers radius zone. And it's interesting, we, we talk a lot of things and of course we talk about nuclear energy and what he, what he shared was very interesting, I thought was nuclear energy is one of the, is a very good source of energy that's constant and probably 100% controllable that we can control. Except that humans are t- still too young, still inexperienced to handle it. We are too young to handle it. Mm. I thought that was very interesting, you know, that we lack the foundations, we lack the philosophy, the mindset to control nuclear energy. And what he says is, okay, so we, we are facing this, you know, energy crisis, right? Just bear with it first. Gaman, in Japanese we call it Gaman. Just bear with it. I mean, um, we've lived on inconsistent energy before. Wind, solar and uh, uh, hydropower water so it's okay we can do it and probably we don't need nuclear energy probably just as a transition energy so i thought that was interesting yeah i'm excited to write the article but back to the day yeah what are we going to do today well i'm going to do just external articles um we'll eventually get to the podcast of uh, zambert articles so we've got that covered so i thought today since it's a short stream, I'll pick uh, two articles. And these two articles uh, will talk about the foundations, the mindsets, the philosophies that we can bring um, in, in the up, we can use in the upcoming era against, the, uh, against, the, uh, against climate crisis. And yeah, so our first article, yeah, the first article comes from The Guardian. It is titled, Our Entire Civilization Depends on Animals. It's time we recognize their true value. This article stood out to me because it's the same thing we've been reminding people about on uh, Zambert Media. Uh, it reminds us, uh, this article reminds us of the importance of di- biodiversity, especially the dependency of different animals and plants. One of the examples the article brings up is uh, ocean life. Yep. And yeah, about how whales consume marine creatures. Uh, including krills, of course, uh, who then release uh, feces to fertilize blooms of planktonic uh, algae. One of the missing pieces, uh, that, uh, one missing piece from this cycle can actually destroy the ecosystem. So the author reminds us that we are dependent on the biodiversity and healthy ecosystems to survive. And many of the problems that we face today. Uh, as the human race is because we have a, a broken relationship uh, with with nature. You know, we treat nature as a u- utility, which 
we sh really shouldn't. It's not something that we use for our selfish growth. Instead, we should actually shift our perception to see ourselves as part of the wider natural system in which we have responsibilities towards other life forms. And of course, this is something that Zember has talked about before again and again. Now, on, on the first level, you know, it's the same thing that this article is talking about. Um, we are not masters of nature, you know, we are not a separate identity not a separate existence from the natural system. Instead, we should, we should understand that human beings are part of that system. We are a part of nature. We have strong influences on it. And if we destroy the system, we destroy ourselves. And I'd like to take the idea further. We've talked about this, of course, in, in, on, on Zambert Media. And that is, we should look beyond just acknowledging that we are a part of nature, that we have an influence. But we should think about, you know, we have the influence, not just to protect nature, but to regenerate it. From time to time, you hear probably scientists, uh, even, you know, circular economists going, uh, we should create a, a regenerative economy. And that's what it means, you know, to give, to, to regenerate our resources, to regenerate nature. Imagine if we take one unit of resource from nature, we can give back two. And that's a very good thing. And that's the kind of mindset that we want to bring into the next era. And we have this before. Um, I, I keep bringing this up, but in ancient Japan, it has, has, has done it before. And that, that is based on the prosperity of uh, nature, prosperity of society, rather than econ economic growth based on selling more. Doesn't make sense. So, um, of course, uh, we are naturally... Mm, our next question naturally will be, you know, how would that look like? And other than, you know, looking at ancient Japan for hints of a circular and, and, uh, economy, we have modern examples how we can exist in nature rather than separate. And this next article uh, shows that this next article comes from PV Magazine, uh, titled Butterflies, Bees, Sheep, and Solar Energy Production Can Coexist. Now, this article opens up by saying that there are many ways um, for us to make the energy transition to renewables, and some are more sensitive to nature than others. Uh, energy sprawl or the increased use of land and water spaces to support energy infrastructure could rise over the next uh, several decades, working against some of the environmental goals that are the foundation of renewable energy deployment. And this is something that we should think about. Um, even, even within the SDGs network, um, you know, if we promote one goal, we often sacrifice another. And that is the balance that we are trying to find out. But um, this this article actually says it doesn't have to be that way, uh, and it raises uh, it shares one of the examples, which is a solar project in Ottawa, Canada, uh, developed by EDF Renewables EDFR uh, as an example. The solar project uh, is very successful, even doubling the PV capacity of the entire country of of uh, of Canada, but. You know, one of the landowners said, you know, we want we want the land back to we want to return the land back to agriculture after we decommission this project. But EDFR didn't wait for the decommissioning. So over the years what they have done is uh, they even reach out to uh, local honey companies to build beehives at the site. Um, they even provided a habitat for monarch uh, butterfly uh, to strive. They even started a sheep grazing project. You can see the sheep here. Uh, to raise sheep and even provide additional revenue for farmers. So this this article actually caused this uh, a win-win for farmers and solar de developers. And you know, with this development comes the opportunity to build a future that is sensitive to all life on earth and the farming needs of local communities. And this is, this is another mindset that I wanted to share is that, you know, um, very often when we talk about sus uh, sustainability, there's always this fear that, you know, we have to give up our, our, our conveniences. 
to our way of life to achieve sustainability. And it doesn't have to be that way. And this is one example of it. Uh, this is the second mindset that we want to bring along uh, on top of the first one, which was, you know, uh, you know, we are a part of nature. And now I want you to take away, yes, we can coexist with nature without big sacrifices uh, that we, we are so f- afraid of. Again, um, I think uh, I think Japan is a perfect example of that. We, we not we, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, Japan, uh, centuries ago, even a millennia ago, it was sustainable. It was regenerative and it was circular. But it doesn't mean that we have to give up modern conveniences and live like the past, like 400 years ago, where electric- we don't have electricity, we don't have high speed vehicles, we don't have the internet, no Wi Fi. Well, that's scary. Um, so, we need to take the philosophy uh, to care about nature. And for example, uh, Right, we need to take the philosophy to care about nature, sorry. And we need to couple it with modern technology. And with that, we can live uh, without sacri- making huge sacrifices that we are scared of. I mean, we have the technology to harvest uh, energy from solar, from wind, uh, from water, uh, effectively, rather than in, like how we did in the past. So we have, so the basic idea is to combine um, I wouldn't call it ancient, but you know, uh, old philosophy with modern technology. Hmm. But I'll be honest, uh, we are not going to be able to keep all the conveniences. There are two types of conveniences in this world. So one, I call it the uh, u- utility convenience. The other, excessive, uh, excessive uh, convenience. Utility conveniences will be useful. It's the right way of using. For example, if you put, uh, if you look at vending machines. If you find a vending machine in a secluded area, uh, it is a good thing because rather than putting a person there selling drinks, you are providing a service um, uh, that that people need, that is useful, that makes sense, that makes sense because for example, uh, excessive convenience. Uh, if you've been to Tokyo or Osaka, you can imagine you see a row of vending machines and then look to your left, there's a convenience store. Look to your right, there's another convenience store. Look behind you, there's another set of vending machines. It is a very consumeristic uh, way of looking things, of building things, and we don't need it. That is excessive. We have forgotten what the convenience is for, and it's something that we need to change. I mean, I lived in places that didn't even have convenience store. I was worried at first, but after one month of living, it's like, yeah, this place doesn't need convenience stores and yeah for certain areas we really don't need the convenience until we lose it and say hey yeah we didn't need it in the first place so yeah anyway that's the end of today's uh, stream it's a short one um but i think this is the this is the let's say this is the format that we want to go for whenever i won't be able to make uh whenever we have interviews or we are moving around like next week i'll, I'll be moving away from uh, Fukushima to another prefecture. Excited about that. But yeah, um, I'm going to stop here before I rant more about uh, conveniences. And yeah, it's to you, it's to you, it's rainy season. I'm not sure if I'll be able to ride my bicycle to the next place. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to that. So anyway, yeah, that's the end of our stream today. So signing off here. Make sure you re- recharge yourself this weekend. And we'll see you when we see you.